Hey everybody, it's Damien Gergier from The Breakdown Show and today's guest is Deborah Stone. Dr. Deborah Stone has taught and brandized for decades. Her books have often become the standard for understanding policy and decision making. Her latest book, Counting, explains the fallibility of numbers. You can get the book on Amazon, of course. Uh, Dr. Stone has taught and Brandeis, also MIT and a variety of other places. She's got roots in political science as well as other social sciences. Dr. Deborah specializes in analyzing the politics of policy making in advanced industrial states as well as developing countries. She is most known for her textbook on the topic Policy Paradox, the Art of Political Decision Making, which has had four editions over 25 years and has been translated into five languages. Her research focuses on health policy, disability policies, caregiving, but also addresses a wide range of policy issues. Also joining us today on the episode as co-host is Grant Martin, who's working on his doctorate at NC State. During his study, his program uses the Bora books. Save the Brave, go to savethebrave.org and support our veteran tribe, savethebrave.org. Also, if you want to support the Break It Down Show, you can go to breakitdownshow.com and donate some money into the PayPal field. You can also buy some of our merch and you can watch our videos on YouTube and, of course, subscribe. All right, enough of me. Here comes Dr. Deborah Stone. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. Is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from the Offspring. This is Nathan this is East. Sebastian Young. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hi, this is Deborah Stone, and we are on the Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. That's right. And I've got Grant Martin in studio as well. Uh, I'm on the California coast up north, uh, about Trinidad or so. And so you'll see the camera go to the uh, outside camp. Still foggy here in the morning, you guys. And I, I, I love being able to do this stuff. So I'm on the California coast. You guys are on a different part of the nation than me altogether. And, and that's just, uh, I think it's wonderful. <laughs> interesting about your accounting and then the other books that you've written and, and your work, Deborah. But first, let me uh, let me let Grant explain why you're here and, and why we're excited about it. Grant? Thanks, Pete. No, I'm, I'm honored to uh, be able to talk to Deborah. Um, this is, you're, you're kind of like a rock star in, at least in my academic world. Um, but so I am a, I'm a U.S. Army officer, but I'm also uh, studying at NC State University under uh, Dr. Brandon Noel. In public administration and our our public policy class, um, led by Tom Berkland, had us read your book Policy Paradox. And up until that time, I I witnessed in the military a lot of paradoxes and, and been really curious as to why uh, we do what we do. You know, sometimes contradictory, and there's just a lot of paradox going on. A lot of things that I just couldn't understand and and wondered why. The bureaucracy did what it did. And then I, I read your book, Policy Paradoxes, as part of, uh, of the policy class. But interestingly enough, um, a lot of military uh, officers, professors at the War College, uh, people at Special Operations Command also recommend that, that book, that Policy Paradox book. So I don't, I don't know how, if you know how, uh, how kind of uh, famous you are, but I was wondering, I w I'd like to start out by asking you, what led you to that book, The Policy Paradox? and the ideas that were in that. Thanks, Grant. Uh, first of all, I want to say I'm, I've am i been really thrilled to get to know you. Um, I can't tell you how exciting it is for an author to have a student come live. Um, we, we, it's Being an author is such a virtual world. You put your words out there and you have no idea if anyone's reading them, who's reading them. And then to find out that someone not only read your book, but... Um, it spoke to them. Uh, it's, it's just wonderful. And we have, I should say that Grant and I have had some great conversations and email exchanges. Uh, so, and that's one of the wonderful things about being a teacher is um, that you learn so much from your students. And 
I've already, and just in the last week, I've learned so much from Grant. So why I wrote this book, uh, I went to graduate school in political science. And um, at the time I went to graduate school, there was no field of public policy. It was sort of bread and butter political science. We studied um, American democracy, political parties, how people fight to get control of the government. Uh, and if, and uh, if you were interested in international relations and defense policy, you could study that. But I was uh, working mostly on uh, social issues. Uh, so, um, what, uh, and then just as I came out of graduate school, there was a new field of public policy being created. Foundations were pouring money into schools to set up programs in public policy to get power. The idea behind public policy is what do governments do with their power once they have it to make life better? And that was what I was interested in. That was what I cared about. So, so I went into this policy field. I got my first job in an institute of policy sciences, it was called. And um, it tried to be very scientific. All the other faculty were teaching statistics and economics, and uh, and they were. I quickly realized that the field was searching for scientific answers to the best way to do things, the best solutions to policy problems, as though there's one right answer or one best way. And if you get the math right, you you get the right answer, and your program will work fine and do what it's supposed to do. Uh, doesn't work like that. I knew enough as a political scientist that that's not how politics works. Um, and there were just a lot of things that couldn't be explained in that. So um, in the course of teaching, I was supposed to teach. I was the only political scientist on the faculty. And I was supposed to teach the students how to get their neat, mathematically pure solutions through the policy process. And I knew that putting formulas on the blackboard was going to glaze people's eyes over <laughs> not, <laughs> not doing it. So, so I, this book actually grew out of my teaching notes, my, my efforts to try to explain to students how politics works. And, and so and I mentioned my military so experience. I mentioned my military experience. I've had a lot of, um, I've had a lot of experiences where the, Military wants to be rational and objective, and and you know, like like you say in your book, counting, you know, bring up some numbers, and assume that's the truth. And I'm wondering, in this day and age, we've got a lot of polarization. Uh, people seem to be breaking off into their tribes and not want to talk to each other. What do you say to those who say, well, you know, actually, we could use a little bit of rationality, right? some objectiveness. I, I often feel that way myself. And in the, uh, the book, um, I, I, I uh, portray the, this, what I call the rationality project is this idea that there's one form of reason that all right thinking people agree to. It's, it's logic, basic Western logic. Um, and, um, if you, uh, and you make scientific observations and you somehow figure out what causes things and uh, how things will work, if you, how different policy alternatives or programs will work if you put them into, into, uh, into place. And um, that's a nice ideal and it's a nice hope and we all hope for that, to be able to find you know, right answers. Um, but I knew that values come into play. I mean, we all know values come into play when people, it's not like logic determines everything. So let me give you an example. Efficiency is one of our biggest ideals. Efficiency is basically the idea that um, getting the most for the least, getting the most bang for the buck, getting to where you want to go with the least effort or by taking the shortest route. Those, those are various concepts of efficiency. And I think that in in the rationality model, people think that there's one kind of efficiency. There's one best route to get to where you want to go. I, 
I think one of my favorite examples of why that's wrong and why efficiency might mean different things to different people. When I go to the doctor's office, I often have a long wait. And uh, the reason I have a long wait, even though they make appointments, is because the doctor is trying to be efficient with his time. So he schedules everybody at, let's say, 15-minute intervals. Um, and some people take longer and some people take less. But what he cares about is not wasting his time. He wants the next person there when he's ready for that person. Meanwhile, all of us sitting in the waiting room are wasting a little bit of our time. Well, because we don't fit exactly into the slot, right? So the doctor's efficiency is my waste. Uh, as a, and I wanna say, I don't, that doesn't bother me at all. When a doctor is late to see me, I think hallelujah. He's giving as much time to each patient as they need. So I don't mind some sacrifices in my efficiency to get really good compassionate care later on. But I think that's a good example of why, um, um, you know, there's not one, one ultimate efficiency for everybody. Why do we start think, with um, things like, a, I was going to say, why do we start with things like efficiency when we're, when we're trying to work on problems instead of maybe like a critical path? I know you know, when you look at working overseas like Grant and I have, oftentimes the critical path is delicate, it's deliberate, it has errors in it, but there is no faster way to do it. I mean, we we try to make the government work, right, like in Afghanistan, and you can't even get a request to go up to the ministerial chain and back down successfully without having a problem. And so you have these little ankle-biting problems that you never think about that undermine the success and deny efficiency in general. Uh, that's that's really a great idea. And, you know, Grant and I have talked about that, that how um, when you go into a situation in the military, it never looks on the ground like it did on paper. You know, um, it's and you have to be prepared to adapt. And um, as you say, you know, oh, uh oh, this isn't what it was supposed to be. What do I do? Send a message up upstream, wait to get the message downstream. Meanwhile, something else might have changed, right? So um, this idea that uh, that you're on, I, I like that. Efficiency is one straight path to the end. And a real efficiency or real effectiveness might be instead allowing for a lot of deviation. Wait a minute, let me step off the pathway here and listen to someone and find out you know, what they know about the situation. And, and one of the things in the in the policy paradox book that I really loved was, and I forgot I had it had my props here. Um, the uh, was the idea of the viewing politics in terms of the rational actor model, um, or the or the uh, rational market model, that things operate rationally like a market, and and then on the other hand, your idea of the of the polis viewing things as as this this polis model could you uh describe that the, the polis model versus the market sure there's another thing that um that has really happened in the public policy field is uh that um economists have come to be the most prominent and um dominant i would say discipline in the field um and um, and their image of society is the market. Um, and markets are, um, um, it, some markets are real, like the supermarket or the farmer's market. That's a real market. But for economists, a market is a theory. It's a model. It's, it's really a fiction. Um, and in that, it's a simplified model of, of reality. And in that model, in that fiction, people... It's not a real place. People trade with each other. That's all they do. Um, they have no community life, unlike a real village, let's say, or even a real farmer's market. Um, they um, So all they do is, is they care about getting the best deal, the, getting something for the lowest price, so getting a bargain. Um, there's efficiency again, right? Um, um, 
And the polis is my term for a real community. It comes from the ancient Greek uh, Greeks who called their community a polis. And it was a community where everyone got together and they decided on the laws and the policies. Well, everyone but the women and the slaves. Uh, but uh, that was the, you know, sort of the beginnings of democracy. And in a, in a real community, people interact with each other in lots of ways besides buying and selling. They're members of families, they have friends, they have teacher-student relationships, doctor-patient relationships, they have neighbors, they have teammates, um, and, you know, they go into stores. But um, but we have all these uh, different relationships, and, um, and most important, I think, is that in the polis or any community, people um, care about one another. In the market, they care about their self-interest. They're just trying to get the best deal for them. And um, in the polis, people, there's also altruism. People care about one another um, and in different ways, in different levels. They have very, very close relationships and, and weaker friendships, but, uh, uh, but there's lots of that. I have a, a, a great story I want to tell about uh, the market becoming a polis. Uh, my cousin Penny has, was um, just really lonely. Um, she's widowed and she was really lonely during the pandemic. And she made herself a uh, a deal that she would go out in an, on an excursion every day, just one little excursion. And she said, I just go into a store because I like to hear someone say, may I help you? <laughs> uh, and it was just a, you know like a connection a form of friendship and then I saw there's a cartoon in the New Yorker that was a very similar idea it's a it's a woman talking to a shopkeeper and and the shopkeeper says may I help you and she says yes uh, could you just tell me everything's going to be all right <laughs> so even in markets I mean like even in a store like in markets People care about each other, and they care more about uh, they care about other things besides just um, closing the deal. No, and, and, and so um, oh, I'm sorry. yeah, I just want to say that um, that you know the point of going into all this is that I believe that policymaking will be more successful if we design it taking into account t- trying to harness altruism along with self interest. Uh, the the economic free market model is just let everybody pursue their self-interest. And some, if everybody maximizes their interest, somehow the general well-being will, um, we, you know, will, will happen. Um, but I believe that, that uh, we're better off if we try to harness some of these altruistic motives uh, and that people, um, people, no one wants to live in a community where, where no one cares about anybody else and everybody just cares about them with themselves. And, and that's really the essence of community is helping each other when the chips are down. So, uh, so I've tried to, um, to, you know, formulate some policies where, uh, where that's really the goal. How do we help, help ourselves help each other? And, and one of the other ideas you had on the, on the polis that I really liked was this idea that, that the polis follows laws of passion or emotion, and whereas the market follows laws of matter. And you know, throughout my career, we, we love phys- physical metaphors. And so um, I don't know how familiar you are with Clausewitz, but Clausewitz talks about the center of gravity. And, and we love that metaphor because we turn it into a, a categorical and analytical tool, which we'll, we'll talk hopefully a little bit later. I, about. I missed what I missed the word, uh, Grant. I'm sorry, I missed. Faustus talks about what? Oh, Clausewitz talks about the center of gravity. Clausewitz in in oh, the center of gravity, right? And and we've turned it into a categorical analytical tool, so we put things in categories, which we'll probably get to in a little while. But uh, one of his other concepts is is you know passion. Um, it plays a huge deal, a huge part in, in warfare, but just in general, in, uh, in human relationships. And I, I just, in fact, Pete probably knows about this, but I just uh, recently learned that the shadow brokers, the guys that, that back in 2016 leaked a bunch of 
national security agency tools uh, on the on the internet. Um, they did something that they didn't need to do. You know, it wasn't it was it was a technical thing that they released, but they did it in a way. And I can't remember the exact wording of it, but they did it for no other reason than to poke the NSA. Like it was a middle finger to the NSA. And, you know, that, you couldn't have seen that coming. I, you know, that, that's, that is total. That speaks to your, I think, your idea about the laws of passion, the laws of emotion. And that has a lot more uh, sway in the polis and, and society, I think, than the, you know, the laws of matter, even though we do have some physical uh, you know, portions of our, of our lives as well. Yeah, that's a great example. And also, I should, I think, you know, Pete, you she pretty much came up with the same idea about affect more than effect, right? But, um, so, um, um, matter is finite. Um, and, so, and one of the laws of matter is that um, uh, resources can be used up. Uh, I remember in my introductory economics course, they, they taught this concept by, with the example of um, how you could produce either guns or butter, and you couldn't, a, a society could choose to produce guns or butter, but you couldn't use the same resources to produce both. So how do you decide which one to produce, or how much of your resources to devote to guns and how much to devote to butter? Uh, I think yeah. passions are different. They're, um, they're, they're not used up when they're expressed. Take love. Uh, when you fall in love with someone, you keep falling more and more in love. Uh, you have more love, it seems, so you seem to feel bigger and, and it enlarges you and, and hopefully the other person feels the same way. Or uh, how about compassion? Uh, when you comfort a, a crying child, you don't use up all your compassion, if anything. Just spending time with that child and feeling that child's emotions um, that increases your compassion, makes you maybe be more compassionate to other children and other people. Uh, another really important, uh, I think, law of passion is cooperation. That's one of the key features of the polis. The market is all about competition. Right, but the uh, cooperation um, in communities, the more people work together and get to know each other, the more committed they become to each other and to whatever cause that they're working on. They have more energy for it instead of less. So, um, I mean, for example, think about your church community or your sports team or your volunteer work. Um, or for that matter, your job, if you like it at all, you'll, uh, you actually start putting more energy into it. So that's, the, that's, those are examples of why I think um, uh, laws of passion are, are really important. This is a great thing, like for what we try to do when we're overseas, uh, we talk about classmates a lot, and I like to kind of poke the military bear and I say, but the, the civil population is the center of gravity. You know, you can try to go take on a military target and win militarily, but we always win militarily, except for we don't win overall. And we can't create that affect in the villages, in the cities. You can't, you know, we are we are the insurgents in effect, right? We try to bring in this new form of government, new rule of law, but we don't gather people around. And it's not that we have to win hearts and minds. It's that we have to be able to allow the government to establish legitimacy. They don't have a postal service. They don't have banking. They don't have fire departments, none of these things. And so we we focus all this energy on trying to undermine the Taliban, but the Taliban are, are of that area. They are from there. You know, Al-Qaeda, it's, it's partly a political party. So we have all these problems when we look at these situations where we are the bigger problem. I mean, the ground truth is, is that if we did less harm to our own outcomes, we would have the ability to maybe be successful if we can deal with the ground truth. But because we don't, because we use Clausewitz as this thing to outmaneuver an enemy for us instead of, you know, align our efforts to create this affect driven uh, process to create, you know, passion about the police force. Oh, my God, if you could create passion positively for the police force in the uh, in the region, you you would have one way to to win the fight, but we don't look at these things this way. We hate it. We we yeah, people yeah. get mad at me. Yeah. 
Well, and I, I know Pete. Yeah, well, I had a similar experience. No, no, go ahead, Deborah. Oh, okay. So, um, I, about the importance of winning over civil society rather than or in addition to whatever military goals you have. Um, I had a similar experience when I was a graduate student. Um, I went to Germany to study their national health insurance system uh, because I thought it could be a model for the United States. Uh, and that was my policy goal uh, to get universal health insurance. Uh, and um, everywhere I went, I was this young student. I didn't know why, you know, why should people spend time with me? I went and I tried to interview government officials and health insurance officials and so on. Almost every person I talked to started out by saying, I would be happy to help you. Your country and your Marshall Plan did so much to help us after the war. Uh, and I will do anything to help you to pay back. So there you have it. Uh, well, going back to, to one of Pete's, and I know Pete could probably talk about this forever as, as I could, but you know, one of the things we did in Afghanistan was, and this probably gets into your book counting, is we counted. Um, we counted how many police we trained a month and, and of course a year, um, how many police were recruited, how many army guys we trained, how many were recruited. Um, we counted every time we had a troops in contact, which is just a battle, we have to come up with another name. So troops in contact, TIC, called it a tick. So every time we had a tick, we had to count how many enemy we killed. Um, and, and all kinds of other, he could probably you know talk about all kinds of other things that we counted, but but it's it was crazy to me that we counted and we killed in action because I thought one of the big lessons learned from Vietnam was you know McNamara counted how many we killed and 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 here we are in in Afghanistan and, and Iraq as well doing these things that I thought the military had said was a terrible thing um, that was one of the lessons learned from from Vietnam supposedly. And I'm just wondering, you know, I'm in the military and I still don't even know why we were still doing something that we kind of, we had said it was a terrible thing. <laughs> uh, it's, um, yeah, body counts. Um, I think um, you're still counting them as uh, counting enemy killed because bodies are countable and because politicians want metrics for success. Uh, right. And so and what's more easily countable than, you know, people trained doesn't matter what they do once they're trained. But you, you got to measure if you can talk about numbers of police or numbers of, or, or, of people killed. Uh, and this is a great example of um, and, and you know, politicians want these numbers because that's something they can wave at the public and put on TV and say, see, I'm doing a great job. I got this number. Uh, so uh, this is a really great example of how, why values and ideas matter in the polis more than physical things. So what do life and death mean to people besides bodies that are always alive or dead? That's what's really important. You know, what life and death mean to people. And uh, so here you are creating tragedy and heartache and, um, and yet, somehow that counts as success. In what universe is death and and massive amounts of death? In what universe is that success? That's you know that's the value question. And forget the numbers. Uh, it, it's really such a you know a perversion. Uh, here's another thing about you know about numbers that fascinates me, um, and and really what led me to write the book about counting. Any number by itself doesn't mean anything. You say 500 people, 500 people killed today, um, or some you know, general says that. Right? What does that mean? So what? Is that a lot or a little? Uh, well, um, I don't know. It's fewer than um, died in 9-11, but it's uh, uh, more than, uh, you know, more than we're used to, whatever. Anyway, right. is it a lot? Of, how do we know what a number means? Numbers get their meaning from the stories people tell about them. So, 
General McNamara didn't just put out body counts, numbers in the war. He told us in the Vietnam War, he told us what the numbers meant and that they meant we're winning the war. So uh, when people, I say numbers have authors. I like to say numbers have authors, just like books do or you know stories do. And, and when people put out numbers, they tell a story about it. They tell their audience what it means, just, you know, just like an author does. Um, and, um, and in the Vietnam War, so, um, you know, McNamara said, these numbers mean we're winning the war. He tried to, you know, convince Congress of that, keep, you know, keep giving us more money and, you know, authorizations. Um, other people asserted counter stories. This is how politics goes through stories, right? So other people um, said, hey, high numbers mean we're causing, causing a lot of heartache and tragedy. Uh, and, um, you know, um, people are now saying about same thing about Afghanistan and Iraq, right? That we're we're turning people against us because we are that these numbers are to them. They mean something completely different than what they mean to us. Well, one of the things that I got to do was go out and I got to talk to the locals in Iraq. Let's say there was like a multiple car bombing in Baghdad. I could go out the next day, a week later into that neighborhood and say, hey, what's going on here? You know, like you have this horror of 51 people blown up and five different car bombs, complicated attack. But like the very next day, people have lives and they're still continuing their lives. And so you can ask these questions. And so instead of looking at this battle damage assessment and counting bodies like you were talking about, I'm able to say, what do we do about this? And they laugh. They laugh in my face and they go, you know, there's nothing you guys are going to do about it, you know, uh, and we still have to go live our lives. And so you you have to like relook at these problems. You know, we don't just get to look at one body count. You know, if you go, if you fly a drone into someone's house and you don't go back ever, you don't own the affect part of that fight. Whoever's there putting their messaging on whatever happens, whether it's tied to reality or not. And here's a great example. So in Iraq, um, there's a, a, a former nuclear plant that the Israelis blew up. Everybody knows about this all over the Western world. But where I was, and this is called, a place called Tuwaitha for the audience. When I would go around that neighborhood, I would say, hey, what happened here? And they would say the Iranians blew up our nuclear plant. Absolutely not true as to the rest of the world, but there in that region, that was an Iranian attack. And until you could wrap your head around the fact that that is their reality, you and you couldn't change it, you couldn't even begin to understand what it was to be them and what was dangerous to them. I mean, they're way better. Instability is the norm in Afghanistan and Iraq, right? They're way better at that than we are. And so we come with this stability mindset where things, things don't tend to... St- to stability. That's what I've learned. It's, it's, it's elastic, right? And, and so things tend towards instability and power is one through a lot of different means, violence, whatever it is. And because we don't come from that kind of a world, we measure things based upon a normal world where stability is the norm. I'll, I'll, but we're the, we're the exception, you know? But, but the fact that Pete was actually yeah. on the ground and our guys that are on the ground asking those, you know, almost anthropological type questions as opposed to you know, numbers. Um, and so but just recently I was listening to these guys talk about the cyber domain and all that stuff. And th- these were political scientists. And they, at the, at the end of their, their talk, they said, uh, you know, I really wish my discipline would get away from crunching numbers and doing multi-day regressions. I wish they would get more into the details of what actually happened and why. It sounded like they were, they were making a plea for political scientists to get more like anthropologists. And, and, you know, I, I think that goes to, Deborah, your point in the book, Counting, about the tools that we use to understand the social world uh, can't be the same as the tools we would use in, in, in the physical world. And in the physical world, we measure stuff. And like you said, in the physical world, things are static, um, so you can measure them. And in the social world, it, I think it's more, you know, like, like these, these political scientists were saying, although, I've kind of been hearing that for a while, that like we need to become more like anthropologists. Um, but, but could you speak to that a little bit, the difference between the social world and the physical world? And Yeah, sure. And let me just start by going back to what you said about the wishes of some of your colleagues. Um, 
you know, there was a time when political science was a more qualitative discipline. And we did research by going out and talking to people uh, and, uh, and using words instead of numbers. Um, and I was, I feel really lucky because I was in, I got my degree at just the, that the peak of the, uh, the, the tail end of the the qualitative era and the beginning of the quantitative era. And I had two mentors who um, who used words. Um, in fact, when I went to do my dissertation, um, my, my, my research in Germany, um, my advisor said, you know, what methods are you going to use? And I started blubbering about, I don't know, I'm going to look for data on this and look for data on that because I thought that's what I needed to do. And I'm going to read legal documents about how the system works. And she said, are you kidding me? Do you want to sit in some dusty basement reading legal documents or crunching numbers? Why don't you just go out and talk to people? <laughs> so, yeah. And I thank her for you know, you know, giving me that perspective. So um, the difference between this, the tools that we can use in the social world and the physical world, um, I think um, I actually heard a lecture, um, a TED Talk. I listened to a TED Talk last night that Grant recommended about scientific explanation. It was a TED Talk by David Deutsch. And he says... Um, Nature can be expressed or described in mathematical formulas. That's the key, the key thing about the scientific approach to nature. Uh, and I think people can't be described in <laughs> mathematical formulas. So uh, let me give two examples of things that I think are really important to us as human beings, but um, but. Uh, can't be described in, in numbers or captured in numbers. Uh, one is pain and the other is poverty. Uh, so um, if you've ever, you know, been to the doctor for some, you know, sprained ankle or something, that they'll ask you on a scale from one to 10, how bad is your pain? And I don't know about you, but when I get asked that question, I have no idea how to answer it. Um, what, what is a number? What does a four mean? Am I a four or six or nine? I I don't know. I'm always worried about and, giving too low a number, and then they'll stop listening to me, or or too high of a number, and then they'll rush yeah. me. To <laughs> well, that's exactly the point. Is that what it is? Pain is a, is a, the ultimate subjective experience. No one else can feel your pain, <laughs> despite what they say, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, and so, and in that medical encounter, that's exactly what it's about. Is the doctor going to do anything to help you or not? Does the doctor think he or she should, you know, step in and do something uh, about it? Um, um, I had a friend who, um, she uh, have a friend who has very severe um, cancer and a lot of pain from it. And she's uh, marvelously been you know doing really well but every time she goes to the to the doctor they ask her what's your number and and she said to me they don't want it they don't they don't want you to be above a five and I said what does that mean does that mean um you you know you just tell them what they want to hear or something and she said no it means um if you're above a five they they think you're in too much pain and they want to do something to control it. So she's learned, and I've since talked to other people who've said exactly the same thing. She's learned that if she wants more medication, she'll say she's six. Or if it's really, you know, what, what, you know if, she's that, if the pain is bad enough to her and if she doesn't. Um, I had a, another friend who um, said he was younger, he had... Um, cancer and he was in the hospital and he said I quickly learned to give a number that would um, so I wouldn't get more um, painkiller because I didn't want to be a zombie so it, this this numbers become a language of communication and strategic you know dealing uh, with each other um, and I think that's a way that um I mean, I think the pain scale has become very useful to people, and it it, um, but to 
pretend that there's any objectivity about that. It's crazy, right? It's become useful because it's created a language to talk about something that is non-mathematical and, you know, and subjective. The other example I give is poverty. Um, how much income does a person need not to be poor? That's how we, that's how we make poverty policy. Um, in the United States and pretty much every country, we decide whether people are going to get social assistance based on whether they are above that number or below that number, right? Uh, and um, so uh, there's a difference. The, the reason this is a controversial number, or these, uh, it's a controversial way to measure poverty, is because there's a difference between want and need. We don't feel obligated to give people everything they want. But we do, most of us feel obligated to try to help people who, uh, who, who, you know, have absolute needs. Uh, um, so um, poverty is an idea. It's an idea about when, when, we, um, when we want to give assistance to people. One way to measure it is um, we could tote up the cost of food and housing and medical care and other essential things. And then we could say, come up with a number and say, um, uh, a family of four needs about $25,000 a year um, based on those costs to not be poor, um, to, to you know, survive and survive well, you know, well enough with, you know, decent nutrition and housing and so on. And that's pretty much what we do with the, uh, with our poverty line, but poverty is also um, relative. Um, you, you, people compare themselves to the people around them. So, um, an amount of money that would make you rich in a village in India would um, leave you dirt poor in New York City. Right? And you're, um, it's, it's not like there's one amount of money that uh, you know, one number that is the line between poverty and, and not, you know, not poor. Um, uh, that, uh, one, one little, uh, yeah. Oh, one little story, like the Gallup polls, they've been doing for about 40 years. They, they ask every year, how much money does a person in, um, in this society need to get along? And over the 40 years, the number has gone up along with the average income of, you know, of people. People want to be like the Joneses and they want to. So, um, and I think Adam Smith, who, you know, the famous uh, Wealth of Nations guy, um, he had another way to think about need um, that I really like. He was writing in 18th century England and he said, uh, he said, uh, in, um, People should be uh, things that um, should be considered necess uh, necessaries. We call them. We would say necessities, but necessaries. A thing is necessary if a person would feel ashamed not to have them. And the example he gave was he said, you know, in ancient Greece, um, a linen shirt would be a luxury, but in our day, 18th century England a laborer who went out without a linen shirt, went out in public without one, would um, would be ashamed and probably wouldn't get hired. So um, there are standards of dignity and standards of decency. And that's really important. Again, coming back to values and emotions, right? Um, uh, we, um, uh, there, how much a person um, does a person need to feel that they belong to society, that they have respect, um, and that they can carry themselves um, with dignity? So, so ultimately, the way we think about these these ideas and values that are so important to us, like pain and poverty, um, they they rest on our motives. They 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 rest on what we feel morally obligated to do about problems. Um, when do we feel about feel okay about people asking us for help? And when do we feel okay about asking others for help? That's what goes into all the thinking about, about poverty and pain that um, isn't, 
at all, you know, captured in the numbers. Deborah, one of the things that I know, and I'm a big Deborah, fan of quantitative of data. Know, We've talked a, a lot about this. We've talked a lot about this. So when I go out, I want to find things out, but I have to remove myself from the equation. So when I go out to ask these questions, it can't be my goal to get, I can't look for data that will support my findings in my head, right? And it's really easy to do that, whether you're on the left side of the political spectrum or the right, you know, it's, it's hard to wash yourself out of these conclusions to truly understand the reality that's there on the ground. And, that, and that's one of the problems with, with qualitative data. You know, I, I can talk about a hundred different examples where we try to take a multivariate problem and make it a univariate solution for it, and it doesn't work. You know, sort of the problem, not, and I would say it's not just a problem with the qualitative side of research and questions it's the problem i think as you mentioned in the book counting with the quantitative side as well and that's how do you take your biases your frame out because we all have these you know these ways that we view the world and so to think that we can come in and objectively look at whether it's numbers or someone telling us a story and and put our our you know, way of looking at the world aside and objectively collect these things and interpret them and then report them is, is naive, right? But that's not a qualitative or a quantitative problem. That's a that's just a problem, whether you're doing numbers or or stories, right? Yeah, it is a, um, it is a problem. And I think I, one thing I did hear Pete say is that we have a tendency to look for either data or stories that confirm our own uh, opinions or biases, whatever you want to call it. And there's a lot of interesting cognitive psychology work that shows that that is how people think, um, that uh, they do tend to um, over give more importance to data that confirms their beliefs and underestimate or ignore data that, uh, that you know, disagrees with them. So um, I, I think... Um, that's something, if we know that about ourselves, we can try to counteract it by actively asking people to um, play devil's advocate with us or disagree with us. And by looking for um, uh, for people or readings or whatever who um, that um, that are. Um, you know, that disagree with us and it's just try to um, restrain ourselves from dismissing them right away and to say, well, let me think about that. Uh, let me say to yourself, let me think about that and see if I can, um, uh, you know, come around to it. And here, I think talking to other people is so important. This is where, you know, numbers can't help, but um, talking with people who disagree with you, if you can establish an alliance, a friendship, a care for each other first, then say, can you put me in your shoes? Show me how you think about this. Um, and something I try to do is um, say, give me specific examples, or I'll come up with an example and say, how do you, you know, tell me how you how you would think about this. So, but, and I think that's you know an admirable thing to try to try to you know counteract that. And, and one, one of the keys, I think one of the key points of your book counting was that that's not a problem just with with qualitative uh, data or stories. That's a problem with numbers as well, that, that we cherry pick our numbers. Um, numbers aren't objective. Um, but that is it is a, a criticism I have heard with qualitative research. That it is more you're more likely to be uh, biased or, or see things that you'd like to see. but. But I think that was the point of your book, Counting, is that no, that's the same problem with the numbers as well. The story behind the numbers is is just as important as the the, the number itself. But a lot of times we try to reify that number and and, and pretend it's an objective thing, right? Yeah. Uh, actually, Grant, you sent me an article about um, how mathematicians, people who are quite savvy at math, uh, they did somebody did experiments and they gave a problem to people who are quite good at math and people who were not so good at math um, and um, asked them to solve the problem and the problem involved um, I think um, involved gun control and whether the um, 
whether gun controls would reduce the amount of violence and deaths from guns or not. And there were right. certain numbers that purported to be, it was an experiment, right? That purported to say they did or they didn't. Um, and it turned out that um, people who, even people who were mathematically more savvy were more likely to get the wrong answer um, with the, um, than people who are not mathematically savvy. That what really, if they had strong feelings about the issue, so they would just say that the mathematically right answer was the one that agreed with their ideology. Right, right. <laughs> so, uh, so it's, it's go- not only a problem with, with qualitative, it's a problem with quantitative. Right. And, and going back to one of your earlier comments about abstractions, trying to measure or put a, some kind of numerical value on an abstraction. Um, I think I shared the story with you that, that we've tried to measure all kinds of abstractions in, in Army training. Um, to include, I've seen, you know, people trying to measure courage and, and things and, and trying to put it on a 10 point scale. You mentioned pain on a 10 point scale, but, um, you know, but even, even other kinds of abstractions, like I've seen, uh, your capability to do unconventional warfare as an individual. And that's not, that number is given, you know, that, that, that abstraction really, um, because that's, that's packing a lot of stuff into measuring an individual, um, that, that is given a value for a student, five, six, seven. And I was telling you that I was asking my instructors uh, where these numbers came from. And I said, well, you know, if they if they pass, they get a seven. If they don't pass, they get a three. And that's about it. That's all we have time to do anyway. And we don't even know what the numbers mean anyway. And, and then we would aggregate all those numbers together. And we'd have to explain why what one of these abstractions down for a whole class. <laughs> and it was really just reflecting how many people recycled or got picked up. But but in terms of categories, I think that's one of the ways that we that we uh, the subject of categories. That's one of the ways I think that we try to make sense of abstractions. So if we can take an abstraction and reduce it down to some categories, um, it makes us feel good. And and one of the things that I've always seen in the military is the dime. We call the dime construct. Uh, diplomacy, information, military, and economic, and they're they're sources of power, and th- those are categories. And you know, so we break out the sources of America's power into these categories. We look at them. We even look at other countries' dime constructs. And you know, at the end of the day, all we've done is break it, reduce some some subjects down into these categories. There really isn't any analysis. In fact, I, I think it's interesting that these categories aren't even the same. I mean, information is not the same as military. <laughs> no. I mean, it's, it's just boggles my, my, my brain when we do this, but, but you go into that subject, categorical thinking in, in the book County. I think uh, the, the most surprising thing I came up with when I started thinking about counting was when I realized that if counting isn't just a matter of going lining up things and going one, two, three, you know, and so on, putting numbers on number words on things. First, you have to decide what it is you're counting, what belongs in the category of your counting. The best way I know to illustrate this is this book. Um, so, Dr. Seuss, One Fish, Two Fish. Um, it it begins. One fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish, black fish, blue fish, old fish, new fish. This one has a little star. This one has a little car. Say what a lot of fish there are. And when I looked at this book when I wanted to, I started working on the book about counting. I wanted to see how did children learn how to count. And I thought this was a counting book because it starts one fish, two fish. But did you see what happened? He didn't get past two. And I think the reason he didn't is because he got so enchanted by all the different kinds of fish that he stopped counting and instead started noticing their characteristics. Uh, And then a later line says, uh, some are high, some are low, some are fast, some are slow. Uh, Not one of them is like another. Don't ask us why. Go ask your mother. 
that to me was that that was my aha moment if not one thing is like another if not one of them is like another how do we know they're all fish why do we call them all fish if they're not like another if everything is unique uh so um and everything is unique it's a human need to put things in categories to make sense of the world we have to you know we name things and um my nose and your nose and a baby's nose and a dog's nose and a camel's nose don't look anything alike, but we call them all noses because it gives us a handle you know, for how to talk about things. Uh, so, um, uh, with, um, that, and that's the, um, the, the, the point about Dr. Seuss, about, about one fish, two fish. If not one thing is like another, and we, it's a human decision to decide what counts as a fish. I think the, um, a really good policy analogy to this is um, the census, the US census that asks questions about race. What race are you? How do we categorize people into, into race? Well, everybody is a mix of their parents' genes and, uh, and their parents are a mix of their parents' genes. And um, if there's any, sort of genetic component to race, any one person is a mishmash of everything and not one of them is like another. So how do we decide, how does the census decide to put people into categories? Uh, and it basically comes up with the Census Bureau, um, used to come up with arbitrary rules, used to have census takers go around and, and look at people and just say, according to their looks, did they have curly hair and brown skin? Then they were black. Um, or um, who did they live with? Uh, and then starting um, in 1960, the census allowed people to, to say what their own race was. So the question asked, what race are you? And people could fill that out. But it's a total problem to count race in the census because um, because of sex. Lots of things are problems because of sex, right? This is a problem because people um, reproduce sexually and their children are a mixture of, you know, of who they are. How do you count the children? Even if you, if you would agree on what the adults are, how do you count the children um, of a, of a mix, so-called mixed race marriage? Uh, so that's the real problem with um, um, categories. And, and I think um, I know we uh, probably have to end soon, but um, I think um, to be smart about using numbers, that's the first thing you should ask is who did the counting? Why did they do the counting? What did they decide to count? And what rules did they use for putting things, for counting things in and counting things out, not counting things? Now, one, one of my favorite, you just reminded me of one of my, uh favorite professors at NC State, Dave Garson, he, he spent, he was, he was a staff professor, but he spent probably more of his time teaching us what the numbers couldn't do, you know, teaching us the limitations of different uh, methods. And I, and I just thought that that was brilliant because it was, he was giving us an education way more than just teaching us, here's how you do this method. Um, because then, then, and I, and I, it was, it was amazing because then I would go to Army Special Operations Command and sit in on a uh, sales pitch from from a couple of PhDs who were trying to sell us their their uh, you know proprietary algorithm that purported to you know predict the future and all that they were going to solve world peace and everything. And, and I was able to ask them, well, which method are you using? Well, uh, because of, of the limitations of that method, and here are those limitations, I'm pretty sure you know that's not going to deliver what you, what you're what you're giving us. But but that goes to I think and you and I have talked about being humble um, and, and, you know, having humility when you're using, using the numbers. I, I think that's the most important thing. First of all, I want to take that course. So <laughs> I hope you'll connect me with, um, with your professor and uh, I'm going to write him for his syllabus. <laughs> uh, sounds like a great course, but but yeah, I think um, you know this comes back to what we were talking about about um, about trying to resist our own opinions and 
and, and biases. Um, uh, I think, um, um, again, if, if I were trying to, um, you know, count anything, count courage, count effectiveness, I, the first thing I do is to go to people who are going to be affected by my count and ask them what matters to them. Uh, one of, um, one of my favorite examples is the Everyday Peace Indicator Project in Afghanistan. Um, Pete talked about the number of police we trained, or maybe you did, Grant, as being a measure of our effectiveness. And what um, it, in this um, Everyday Peace Indicators Project, they went into villages and they asked people, how do you know if there's peace in your village? What signals do you get? that tell you that there's peace. And one of the signals was uh, um, if we see police at their out outposts, we know that there's peace. That surprised me because what, what they didn't say was if there are X number of police, then you know we're more secure. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, right. Um, what they felt was that Often, what was really happening is police were collecting their paycheck but not showing up for the job. It didn't matter how many there were, they weren't showing up. Um, and some of them who did show up were raping and robbing the villagers instead of protecting them. So when villagers said, we know there's peace, when we see police at their output, it meant that police were doing their job. They were, they were on the job and they were doing their job. That was the really good measure. So that... And I think having that humility to go say, you don't know what is effective, ask people what they think is effective in their life is, is, is a good way to measure. Well, on that note, I know we could talk about these subjects forever. I did want to throw out the book, Counting. <laughs> um, awesome book. I don't know if I'm actually kidding. Yeah, Pete's back. I was just closing up. Um, but uh, awesome book, highly recommend it. And maybe we can have you back on sometime if, if people allow it, if you're interested, Deborah. I'd love that. Please. I'd love that. Yes, please. You guys have a lot of fun. 